Schreibungen gedreht zu Dämonen, Abschatzen und mit der Eben von Edes von dem noch Kurben sehen die kolossale idische politische Keuches, welche haben uns alle gegeben Kehe und Ausdauer in dem weiter dicken Leben, weiter dicken Wirken und Schatten. Je, yeah, wir haben gehabt Zwistigkeiten und politische Kämpfe. Und wir haben noch bis Hadaioindos. Nicht so kein Sieger in dem Kampf. A viele unser junge Melucher ist gebeugt auf die Quorin von unseren sechs Millionen Kadoschen. Lass mir doch alle zusammen ohne Unterschied von Überzeugungen sehen die glorreiche Geschichte von unserer Verschiedenartigkeit, von unserem Unterschied in Gedanken und in Philosophie, Unterschied in seinen gesunden Erfolg. Totale Einigkeit ist ein Unglück. Wir haben verbeten zu dem heutigen Nachmittag zwei Persönlichkeiten von der akademischen Welt, welche seinen Gut behaben in die beiden politischen Ideen. Oder jeder mir wollen vorstellen, die Redner, will ich vorstellen und gebe mal kurze Begrüßungswort an übergegebenem Tür von die American for, uh, for Peaceful uh, Israel, von Shalem Dicken Israel und Shover Hasair, Dr. Michael Ben Levy, welcher fort in Aportek Aweg als Delegat von der Partei Melex noch ihre Schleien. Wir wollen ihn beten, in kurze Wörter machen die Bakrisus. Michael. but unfortunately I will be speaking in English. Uh, incidentally, I will be leaving next week for Jerusalem, but as a delegate to the World Zionist Congress, the uh, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Zionist movement. <laughs> This today is truly a unique meeting. It is a coming together of three organizations under the auspices of the Yiddish Culture Club. In the Yiddish Culture Club, we have people from three streams, from three groups. We have the Workman's Circle, which is in a sense inspired or an heir or the closest to the Bundes point of view. We, and they are readers or their parents were the readers of the forward. Then we have the Shalom community organization whose members or their parents read the Freiheit. And then we have here also the labor and progressive Zionists though uh, they were essentially in the old time battle as to what would be the national language were on the Hebrew side rather than the Yiddish side, but nevertheless are still Yiddish friendly. And uh, I really have to compliment uh, Dr. Eric Gordon, uh, the executive director of the Workman Circle, for putting this unique meeting together. That, as a matter of fact, it's even more surprising and it's nice that the Sholem community organization, which politically probably were not terribly close to either the Bund or the Zionist movement, are participating in today's meeting. And, uh, and the fact that, that uh, even we progressive Zionists are participating in a meeting which also includes the Bund shows that we are indeed coming together, that many, many of the ideological differences that was 50, 70 years ago 
was a wide gap, a breach that today, since the Holocaust and since the establishment of the State of Israel, many of these ideological questions are today moot. In preparation for the World Zionist Congress and the elections that were held here in the United States, the mere fact that the Workmen Circle sent a letter to its members, and I also am a member of the Workmen Circle, mainly out of memory of my father and mother, although I certainly have no objection uh, ideologically, although I am still uh, president and very much a socialist Zionist, but the, uh, but the Workmen Circle had sent to its members asking them to register as a Zionist and to vote for the labor and or progressive slate. We've come a long way. We indeed have come a long way. This does not mean necessarily that the Workmen Circle or the Bundes are Zionists, but those issues are today moot and irrelevant. Though there were deep ideological issues among the theoreticians on both sides, and incidentally, socialism and Zionism, from our point of view, was synthesized with Borokhov and with the labor Zionist theoreticians. But I'd like to give an example in my own family. My mother, my father came to the United States in 1916, having escaped from Tsarist Russia and went across Siberia through Harbin, Yokohama, and I was born in Tacoma, Washington, and I sent for my mother and brother and sister. From the day they came to the United States to the day they died, they were members of the Arbiter Ring and subscribers to the Forward. Yet, we all went to Hebrew school, Cheder, we were Bar Mitzvah, and my father was a Zionist. So, it doesn't necessarily mean that these things are so mutually exclusive as they appear to be among the theoreticians. As I said before, there has been a convergence and we have come together. And the old arguments are largely moot. And as a representative of Americans for Progressive Hashem Eretz though she is president of the Yiddish Culture Club, I would shake the hand and congratulate Lilka, who is, of course, a Bundist. Professor Marvin Zuckerman. Professor Marvin Zuckerman is Dean from Valley College, here by us in Los Angeles. He is Professor von Yiddish Literatur, Schreiber, Universetzer, von unsere Klassiker, Peretz, Mendele Moiches Forum. Kurz Alemen is a Bundist geboren in a bundischer Heim, bei Tate Mame, so man haben den jungen Sohn geschleppt zu allen Meetingen von der Partei und reingeworfen in mir auf Bett, wo Marvin ist einmal ruhig geschlafen oder gewählt. Er hat in sich eingesagt die bundische Idee mit der Mames Milch und ist stolz mit seinem Bundismus. <lacht> und mit dem, was der Bund stellt mit sich vor. Seinen mir stolz, was er ist stolz. Und mir seinen zufrieden, als Marvin ist zwischen uns. Er hat ungenommen die Einladung, war Kovedig, nicht gegen gestellt sich, und gebracht zu dem heutigen Nachmittag. Ein Bild, welches er hat allein das gemacht, hat er das sonst nicht gesagt. Welche wir haben aufgehangen, da auf der Bank, zusammen mit dem Bild von Herzland, dem Schalter, vom Zionismus. 
zu hundert Jahren Bund Marvin wir seinen Stolz mit dir wir seinen Stolz mit deiner Ergreifungen und wir danken dir verfunden dem heutigen Nachmittag Professor Marvin <lacht> zurück in an eurem Heißkelle, in an eurem Gegend, in der Vorstadt von Vilne, haben sich besorgt, unlegal zusammengetroffen, 13 jüdische Intelligenten und Arbeiter mit dem Zweck zu organisieren eine neue jüdische sozialistische Partei. Sie haben der Partei einen Namen gegeben, der Allgemeiner Arbeiter, Allgemeiner Jüdischer Arbeiterbund von Russland und Polen. Später hat man zugegeben, Bitte zum Fuhren nommen. Aber die Partei ist bewusst geworden, überall unter dem Namen Bund. Jüdische Arbeiter haben schon von früher sich organisiert und angeheben, Protesten, demonstrieren und streiken. Aber jetzt sind sie vereinigt geworden unter ein Form, ein Geist und ein Bulter Namen Bund. Ich meine, es ist schwer, überzugeben, im Werte, was für ein äußergewöhnlicher Einfluss der Bund hat gehabt auf zwei, drei dort jüdische, junge Menschen. Plötzlich haben sie gehabt, eine Hoffnung auf einen besseren Morgen und auf, und auf einen besseren Heimt. Sie haben gehabt, wo zu gehen und was zu tun. Lehnkreisen, Chor, Sportorganisationen. Professionelle Vereine, Redner, Referaten und als Euphanier der Heubener jüdischen Sprache sehr eng loschen. Ein Reus von Heider und Schier und ein Rhein in der größer, breiter, moderner Welt. Gerät zu kämpfen für Freiheit und Recht, schweren Atreiheit und Grenz zum Bund, was er äußerst gewöhnliche Energie und Kraft und Mut und Geist, der Bund hat gegeben, eine neue Jugend, wie euch zu den Erwachsenen untergedruckte Arme Arbeiter. Und der Bund hat euch verbunden, die jüdische Arbeiter mit der sozialistischen Bewegung über der Gorer Welt. Der Bund hat sie gegeben Mut und Stolz. Keiner Erscher hat das Sentiment nicht als euch schön ausgedruckt, wie der Bund Vladimir Medem. Wenn er hat also poetisch und schön verteidigt, was es meint, sein Abundist. Ich zitiere. Das hat er angeschrieben in 1919. <lacht> Hör sich zu zum Wort Bund. Von Binden stammt das Wort. Binden, Vereinigen, Verknippen, Machen von Vielheit der Ganzkeit und schwache Brecklach einmächtige Kraft. Legt zu dem Euer zum Herz von jüdischen Arbeiter. Es klappt ruhig und fest. Guck in die Augen von Chaver, sei seinen offen und dreist. Nimm seine Hand, sie ist stark und hart. Wie kommt das? Wie kommt das, als ein Mensch ein klein Sandel in dem größten Welt mitbohrt, ein kleiner Tropfen in dem bräusen dicken Jam von Leben, was kocht und stürmt? Was ringelt sich herum mit tausender gräusame Sonnen, was zerbrecht ganze Welten, zerreibt und in Stäub Medines und Maluches vernichtet und ertrinkt in seiner Qualies menschliche Existenz und erschier. Wie kommt es, als es steht ein Mensch inmitten von dem größten Wirbelwind und es glanzt seine Augen und es hirt sein Stirn und er hat nicht kein Meure für einen Sturm. Kukareichaber in deine Schumme und du wirst dort lernen, dement werden. Du hast ein Heim und du hast eine Sprache. Du hast ein Boden unter deinen Füßen und du spürst darum dir in der Gufe eine Kraft, was nimmt dich herum und herum 
was trocht dich und stützt dich und macht dich stark und lass dich nicht fallen. Weißt du, Chava, wie es heißt die dosige Kraft? Weißt du, Chava, wie es heißt das dein Heim, deine Sprache, dein Kium und deine Hoffnung? Steh auf, Chava, und heb auf dein Kopf und sing dein alte Schwur. Das ist der Bund. <lacht> Zwischen Hitler und Stalin ist eine jüdische Welt vernichtet geworden. Und mit der dosigen Welt euch der Bund. Aber was der Bund hat euch getan, wird bleiben. Und zudem ist nicht jedes Bläus die lichtige Sterne und auch euch mir werden es nicht vergessen. Der Gedanke Bund wird, wird keinmal nicht untergehen. So hat gelebt schon 100 Jahre und es wird weiter leben. So leben der Bund. Und nicht Liebe Chaverim, wird ihr mir Meuchel sein, für was ich gegenüber zu Englisch sollen die Welche verstehen, die kein Jiddisch euch keine Heim verstehen, wegen 100 Jahre Bund. Seid Meuchel. A hundred years ago, in October 1897, under cover of the Jewish High Holy Days, in the attic of a small, run-down house on the outskirts of Vilna, 13 Jewish intellectuals, writers, and working men gathered together, illegally, from five different cities of the Pale, to form what they decided to call the Allgemeiner Jiddische Arbeiterbund von Russland, Litte und Polen, the General Jewish Labor Bund of Russia, Lithuania, and Poland, which came to be known by the one word, Bund. The organization which they formed came to play a large role in Eastern European Jewish life for the next close to 50 years until it was destroyed by the two great destroyers of our time, Hitler and Stalin, Nazism and Communism. Together with the Zionist movement, the Bund led the masses of East European Jewish life into the modern era, with their heads held high, full of pride, unafraid, and ready to do battle. And what was the Bund ready to do battle for? For Jewish pride, for cultural autonomy, social democracy, Yiddish language and literature, full civil rights in the lands in which they lived, and a trade union movement ready to fight for better working conditions and decent pay. In the course of time, they drew tens of thousands of Jewish working people to their organization, as well as thousands of Jewish youths, intellectuals, and students, young men and women who abandoned the Chedorim and yeshivas on the one hand, or left the gymnasiums and the universities on the other to enter into, build, work together with the poor, laboring Jewish masses in the new, free, fighting atmosphere of the Bund, where they could express themselves not only as socialists, but as Jews. And also in the course of time, the Bund organized Jewish trade unions, built schools for children, published scores of newspapers and magazines, organized Selbstschutz or self-defense organizations to fight off pogromists and fascist anti-Semitic hooligans. It built a summer camp and a sanatorium for children. It created choral groups, sports organizations, evening classes, consumers and producers cooperatives, libraries, dramatic groups, literary clubs, schools for children, and other institutions which served the poor working class Jews of Eastern Europe. The Bund led successful strikes throughout the Pale, strikes among the weavers of Lodge, brushmakers, leather workers, slaughterers, coachmen, all over the Pale. The Bund played a leading role in the 1905 revolution throughout the Russian Empire. And also in that year, in 1905, the Bund organized the Jewish working people of Tsarist Russia into armed bands of self-defense units who successfully fought off pogromists who were attacking Jewish towns and neighborhoods all over the Pale. Listen to Zalman Shazar. This is an account that he wrote. He was the third president of Israel. An account he wrote of how in his youth, the Bund and the Zionist young people together fought off the pogromists in his shtetl of Stopchen. They armed themselves and prepared themselves they had warning that pogromists were coming. This time we were ready. These are the words of Zalman Shazar. This time we were ready. We knew that agitators had come from afar. 
We saw peasant women coming into town with empty wagons, and we knew they were coming to loot and wanted to be able to take the stolen goods home. In the morning, our comrades were on the street, ready with iron rods, lead bars, and whips with rounded piece of lead at their tips. The commanders of the units of ten, armed with revolvers, stationed themselves at many points in the marketplace. At noon, when the peasants poured out of the white church, rabid and worked up, ready to assault the Jews, one of the outside agitators gave the signal and started to lead the peasants to break into the shops. Then all at once, our unit commanders fired their revolvers in the air, not hurting anyone. The shots came from all sides of the marketplace, creating panic and confusion among the crowd of attackers. The horses broke wild. The peasant women began screaming as though they were being slaughtered. <coughs> One wagon collided with another. What, with what seemed their last gasp, the peasants ran in fear from the Jews firing all over the marketplace. It took only a few minutes before the marketplace was emptied of the aroused pogromists. No, Stolpchev, pride of my youth, I cannot believe that you are led like sheep to the slaughter. The Bund attracted some of the finest leaders, spokesmen, and intellectuals that Jewish people, or for that matter, any people anywhere possessed. Vladimir Medem, Henrik Ehrlich, Victor Alter, Akadi Kramer, Neuer Potnoy, to name just a few. The Bund gave rise to a movement that fostered ethics, honesty, democratic values, and its leaders displayed these virtues at the head of their mass, a mass that inspired them and who are in turn inspired by their remarkable leaders. The Bund was the only Jewish party who made the advocacy of the Yiddish language and literature part of its program. It was the only party to argue that Yiddish was a language on a par with all the other modern European languages, but possessing a grammar and a syntax and with as much right to status as all the other recognized language of the world. And many of the Yiddish writers repaid the Bund with their loyalty and creativity. Listen to this account by Mark Schweid of an episode in the life of Peretz. It was on the occasion of a celebration of Peretz's 25th Jubilee in Warsaw as a writer. It was, the scene is at a party in his home in number one, Seglana Street. And this is my translation. The guests were in an elevated mood when there was a ring at the door and two young, unknown personages let themselves in. They were poorly dressed working men. They spoke quietly with Peretz and asked him to go with them into another room. Peretz excused himself from the committee and went into another room with the two young people. A few minutes later, he emerged with his face alight with enthusiasm. In his hand was an old book. The workers quietly left, and then Peretz called out, Do you know who that was? A delegation from the Bund. They sent me an official greeting with this gift. The Polish-speaking guests grew pale with fright and looked towards the door. In the word Bund, they smelled Siberia and the gallows. Denizen calmed them with a quiet act. The official greeting of the Bund he cautiously removed from Peretz's hand and burned in the lighted candle on the table. He gathered the ashes carefully on a piece of paper and threw them into an ashtray. The book copy of Peretz's Yiddish library, Peretz hid deep among his most precious documents that he held dear his whole life. The book, greasy, smeared, torn up from use, came from the 10th pavilion of the Citadel prison, where it had been secretly circulated from one political prisoner to the next. Many single letters were underlined with pencil, which included messages from one prisoner to the next. After this event, Peretz would write with deep sincerity, I belong to no party, but I feel closest to the Bund. And years later, he would say, I found my socialism in the prophets of the Bible. The Bund forged a mass movement which struggled against the Leninist Bolshevik line on the one hand, and, and against what it conceived of as a narrow, chauvinistic, unrealistic nationalist dream on the other. Let me deal with the question of the Bund vis-a-vis -vis the communist movement first. In 1898, it was the Bund that organized the first Russian Social Democratic Federation meeting 
from which Dan, Marta, Lenin, Platanov, Axelrod, Zasulic, and all the other founders and shapers of the coming revolution were to play such an important role on the world stage. The historian Bertram Wolf calls the Bund at that time the largest and best organized body of working men inside the Russian Empire. It is a matter of interesting historical fact that it is because of the Bund that the Leninist communist faction in the Russian Social Democratic Federation was able to acquire the name Bolshevik for majority, majority, majority -ite faction. Remember, the Bund had actually organized the first meeting in 1898. In 1903, at the second convention of the Russian Social Democratic Federation, Lenin, who was chairing the meeting at the time, knew that the Bund wanted to propose at that convention that the Bund be recognized as the representative in the Federation of the specifically Jewish socialist labor movement in the Russian Empire. Because he also knew that the Bund representatives would vote against him and his group on issues important to him, and that they together with the Dan and Matov group would constitute a majority that would outvote him on his program, and because he knew further that the Bund would walk out of the convention if its proposal for autonomy should be defeated, and because he knew the Dan Matov group would vote against the Bund on this one issue, thus ensuring the defeat of the Bund proposal, he made sure to place the Bund's proposal for autonomy on Jewish matters first on the agenda. And sure enough, his strategy worked. The Dan Matov group voted against the Bund, the Bund walked out, and left Lenin's group with the majority, thus enabling him to name his group the Bolsheviks, the majority, and leaving the label Menshevik minority for the Matov Dan group. <laughs> thus it was due to the Bund's insistence on Jewish autonomy within the Russian Social Democratic Federation and Lenin's unscrupulous parliamentary maneuvering that Lenin was able to arrogate the name Bolshevik for himself and his group. The Bund participated in, in a significant way in the first 1917 revolution, its leaders and members playing a prominent role. As for its antipathy to the Communist Party, the Bund, uh, this, the, here are the words of another greatly revered leader of the Bund, Henrik Ehrlich, on that subject, he was speaking in 1918. Is the Soviet government a workers' government? No. It has no right to call itself a workers' government. It has no right to speak in the name of the Russian working class. Another Bundes leader met him, put it this way. Socialism is the rule, the true, not the fictional rule, of the majority, which must in the end take its fate into its own hands. A socialism based on the rule of the minority, however, is absurd. The Bolsheviks stay in power only because their terror has destroyed and made powerless all of their opponents. And in the 1921 convention, the Bund put it still another way. The difference between us and the communists lies in the fact that they believe in the rule by the party, and we believe in rule by the whole working class. We say the working class co government must be answerable to the whole class. The communists, on the other hand, say that if the working class doesn't like the Communist Party government, the working class must still accept the will of the government and not the reverse. The chief error of the Communist Party lies in its effort to turn the might of the working class into a dictatorship of the Central Committee of the Party over the proletariat. As for its struggle with the Zionists, let me begin by saying that both Bundism and Zionism, from our point in time, can be viewed as two sides of the same coin. And that coin is the Jewish response to the nationalist, revolutionary ideas and movements sweeping Europe in the 19th century. It began in the Jewish East European world in that same century with the Haskalah, the Jewish Enlightenment, which brought the first breath of modernism into the closed off medieval world of East European Jewry. From the Haskalah, from the Jewish Enlightenment movement, a straight line can be drawn to the emergence of modern Zionism and that peculiar blend of Jewish nationalism and socialism called Bund. The Bund being a socialist Marxist party 
disavowed any nationalist programs. On the other hand, the Bund expressed the form of nationalism by championing Jewish civil rights, cultural autonomy, Yiddish language and literature, a modern Yiddish school structure, and all the other things I've already mentioned that address specifically Jewish needs and concerns. In that sense, the Bund was also nationalistic. As the great Russian early social democratic social democrat Lenin's teacher Plekhanov once wittily put it, Bundist? Zionists who suffer from seasickness. <laughs> The Bundist argument with the Zionists was a simple one. We are here, not there, in Palestine. The Jews are a world people now, like it or not. All the Jews of the world will never fit into Palestine. There will always be a Jewish diaspora. To deflect the energy and passion of the Jewish people away from the struggle here for our civil rights and a decent socialist world here is the wrong thing to do. We are here and we need to struggle here. As Pettit's himself once put it, Zionism cannot be the solution for the whole Jewish people. We cannot return to the cradle. We have grown in the diaspora, and the diaspora is our battlefield. We do not run away from the battlefield. This attitude was articulated by Medim with his doikite program, his hearness program. Since we are not there but here, we have to fight for a better here a socialist world with dignity and rights for every minority, every people or ethnic group, every language and culture, including the Jewish people and their language, Yiddish. And as the great Bund leader, Henrik Ehrlich said, writing in 1938 about the Zionist dream for a Jewish nation in Palestine, I quote, what can a Jewish Palestine be under the best of circumstances? If a Jewish state should arise in Palestine, its spiritual climate will be eternal fear of the external enemy, the Arabs, and eternal struggle for every foot of ground and for every, every bit of work with the internal enemy. Is this a climate in which freedom, democracy, and progress can grow? Indeed, is it not the climate in which reaction and chauvinism ordinarily flourish? Even Zionist publicists who visit the Holy Land affirm the tremendous influence of clericalism despite the fact that manual workers play such a prominent part in the Zionist organization. An eventual Jewish state cannot offer itself as a spiritual center to the Jewish masses of the Golis lands and as a center for immigration. The Zionists themselves have already significantly reduced their ambitions today. In a memorandum submitted by the representatives of the Jewish agency to the Council of the League of Nations during the September session in 1937, they speak of Palestine as only a partial solution to the Jewish question. How prophetic and insightful his words seem now. History decided this quarrel, or rather Hitler and Stalin decided for them. Who was right? Perhaps they were both right. From our perspective now it is clear that they both fought an honorable, proud, brave fight for Jewish pride and worth and life. All right. We'll skip over some because I'm running out of time. I will skip to uh, the end. <laughs> um, after the Holocaust, after the war, the few remaining remnants of what had been a proud, strong mass movement among Jews picked themselves up and began again. As, a as Leivik put it, I pick myself up again and stride on farther. They assemble in Poland, in Paris, in the DP camps, in New York, Buenos Aires, Mexico City, Montevideo, wherever they manage to get to, and yes, in Israel. And in these cities and places, the Bund lives on. A powerful mythos, movement, ethic like the Bund, an ecclesia militanta, as one historian dubbed it, cannot just disappear. It lives on in small but devoted groups. It manages to publish newspapers and magazines and continues to publish position papers and articles analyzing world events and politics from a Bundist perspective. Its attitude towards Israel is a positive one. It is for a strong and prosperous Israel. But because of its anti-chauvinistic background 
a belief system grounded in internationalism and fair play and justice for all people. It does not allow its positive attitude towards Israel to blind it, to prevent it from being critical when Israel needs criticism. Is it, it is an attitude that most American Jews, including the Zionist movement here and elsewhere, has finally come to see the wisdom of. And the Bund has a devoted following inside Israel itself. They are loyal Bundists, and the Bundist comrades there are just as loyal and devoted to the future of Israel as the most nationalistic right-wing Israeli, but ah, what a wonderful difference between them. So the Bund, in spite of everything, has a present, a vastly diminished present, but it lives nevertheless. And as long as I live, there'll be at least one Bundist in Los Angeles. <laughs> but I know there are many more, and many of them are here today. But does the Bund have a future? Perhaps not. Not as it did, certainly. But so many of its ideas, so many of its ideals are still relevant today. Doikait, being here now with our Jewishness figuring out how to be Jewish here and now and not there because we are not there. Social democracy, the other plank of Bundism, more relevant than ever. The only answer, I believe, to the injustice, poverty, and unmenschlichkeit, inhumanity of the world. An undogmatic, flexible social democracy that places justice and common sense above doctrine and dogma. It is social democracy that has saved the democratic industrialized nations of the world from collapse and chaos and has brought a degree of social justice and decency to the working classes of those nations. And finally, cultural, secular Jewishness that draws on the religious past for its rich moral tradition, folk history, and folk celebration. The Jews of the diaspora cannot sustain a Jewish life by simply facing toward Jerusalem. We are here, they are there. What is to become of us here? The Bund struggled with this question, and perhaps modern acculturated Jewry here and elsewhere in the diaspora can learn from the Bund. One hundred years ago, the Bund launched a new Jewish answer to anti-Semitism, poverty, and the question of how to be Jewish. For one hundred years, it struggled, fought, overcame, and wrote a glorious chapter in the history of the Jewish people. Nothing can take that away. It remains forever. The Hitlerites and the Stalinists crushed it, but the Bund and its approach to Jewish life and to the world live on. So lem the Bund, long live the Bund. Thank you. Professor Marvin Schuckerman, und ich werde rufen den Educational Director, den Bildungsdirektor vom Arbeiterin, Eric oder Ice Gordon, zu begrüßen und den zweiten Redner um vorzustellen, ja. Professor Arnold Benz. Ice Gordon, bitte. <lacht> To be fair, I should call myself Itzhak as much as Itzik. <laughs> uh, I actually, uh, if I may, if I may bend the language a bit, I am here to bind together to form a bond between the Bund and Band. <laughs> I refer, of course, to Professor Arnold Band, who is with us today uh, as our second speaker. Um, uh, Professor Band is the acting chair of the uh, Jewish Studies uh, Department, or, or program, excuse me, I think it's not a department yet, uh, at UCLA, so this is a, a great honor to have him uh, with us. Uh, uh, he's uh, actually my uh, competitor as a uh, Yale man. I uh, hesitate to uh, uh, introduce a Harvard man, but uh, <laughs> so it goes in this world. Uh, Professor Band received his uh, uh, 
uh, undergraduate degree, his BA from Harvard, and in the same year, his uh, Master of Hebrew Literature from Boston Hebrew College. Uh, and he also received his doctorate in comparative literature from uh, Harvard in uh, 1959 with a uh, dissertation on Aristophanes. So as well as being a Hebrew scholar, he is all, also a, a Greek scholar. Uh, uh, within uh, a very short time after uh, receiving his uh, uh, early degrees, he spent some time uh, uh, in, the, uh, in Jerusalem at Hebrew University in the first uh, years of the new state, 1949 and 50, and returned there for several uh, uh, stays uh, afterwards in the uh, 60s and uh, 70s. He also spent a year at the Sorbonne. Uh, his uh, teaching positions have included uh, Harvard uh, and Boston Hebrew College, from which he had uh, graduated, uh, Brandeis University, where he taught the Hebrew and Greek, uh, and uh, most of his academic career has been here in uh, Los Angeles at UCLA. Uh, he was assistant professor of Hebrew, uh, later associate professor, and uh, in 1968 became full professor uh, at UCLA. Uh, he was the uh, chair of the comparative literature department and the founder of, the, uh, of that program. And uh, from 1994 to 96, uh, the founding director and director of the uh, Center for Jewish Studies, and uh, he has returned to that position uh, on an acting basis uh, at present. He's also been visiting professor at uh, half a dozen uh, uh, universities, uh, including, I must say, uh, Yale. So <laughs> we do have that connection. Uh, his publications are numerous, uh, three books and about 125 articles in Hebrew and English on a variety of uh, topics in modern Jewish literature and cultural life. Uh, he's received uh, major awards from uh, virtually every uh, institution of distinction, especially in uh, Jewish uh, letters, and is the, uh, uh, ha has earned three uh, 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 doctorates, uh, uh, honoris causa, uh, that is to say uh, honorary doctorates at Hebrew College, Hebrew Union College, and the University of uh, Judaism. Uh, finally, he is a member of any number of professional associations, as one would expect, and uh, uh, has served on the editorial boards of uh, numerous publications. Uh, <clears throat> finally, I would just observe that, uh, as any uh, scholar of his uh, rank would be expected to do, he has supervised and trained uh, uh, some 25 uh, PhDs uh, in uh, Jewish letters, so uh, a, a whole uh, progeny, a whole legacy is left to us uh, from the work of Arnold Band. I gave you Professor Arnold Band. While one of my uh, predecessors on the podium was speaking, the chairperson, or chairwoman, genially, genially uh, leaned over to me and asked me, do you understand Yiddish? <laughs> it's always assumed that if I'm a professor of Hebrew, I don't know Yiddish. I have a I understand Yiddish quite well, so don't try to tell secrets behind my back. <laughs> uh, I think it's important, before offering a variety, several remarks on points. Can you hear me better now? Yes. All right, fine. I think the other one works. Before offering several remarks, which are pertinent to this meeting, this celebratory meeting, after all, it's a great event, 100 years of the two movements. I think to situate myself uh, within this organization, I have to tell you some personal things. Uh, I am not a Bundist, I am not the son of a Bundist, and I'm not the grandson of a Bundist. I do not come from a Bundist family. In fact, one could say almost the opposite. When you think when you think of the options 
facing Jews in, in Europe at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And we were, we're here talking of two options. One is social activism, which culminates in the Bund, but it wasn't the only group. After all, communism was another possibility. The other one was Zionism, which we've heard about. And 1897 is the celebration of the official founding of these two groups. There were, however, two other options, which we keep forgetting. And you really can't talk about either the Bund or Zionism without talking about the other options. One option for the Jews of Europe was to do nothing. Do nothing. Most Jews did nothing. They just stayed and lived their lives as they were. They did nothing. The second option, which was again a majority option, is leave, go to America. The third and the fourth option, Bund and Zionism, really were minority options. They did not attract millions of people. After all, between 1880 and 1914, three million Jews went from Eastern Europe to the United States. And that included my parents. So we have to put these things in a proper historical perspective. I do so not only because I think what we usually talk about is distortive, but also so you know where I'm coming from. My father was a yeshiva bocher who came from Ponyevej, which is Lita, not large. When I hear your Yiddish, my ears hurt me. <laughs> okay? The Yiddish I heard, my, mother, my father speaking, not to my mother, who didn't know a word of Yiddish. Well, she did know a few words, but not many. She used to say, often table instead of often tish. <laughs> so I always describe it as often table Yiddish. And you know what I'm talking about. Uh, they, uh, she had a vocabulary maybe of 300 words and that was about it. But when my father spoke to his sister, it was always in Litvish Yiddish, it was Ponyevesh. And when I hear people from Ponyevesh, from northern, which is northern Lita, near the Latvian border, I understand everything perfectly. But when I hear you Southerners speaking, <laughs> difficult. And if you came from, say, the Ukraine, it's even worse. So I'm attuned to hearing a certain kind of Yiddish. Of course, the best kind of Yiddish, which is, which is Yivo Yiddish, which is Vilna Yiddish. Now, uh, he was a yeshiva buffer who came to this country and uh, like most yeshiva bachorim, went into business and failed. <laughs> we only hear about those people who succeeded, but 90% failed. He failed. Uh, my mother came as a baby in the er er 1890s from Berdichev. She knew nothing of Berdichev. She knew nothing of Yiddish. She knew nothing of Hasidus. But she was a nice mother. <laughs> But she didn't speak any Yiddish at home. My father had to speak English to her because she didn't understand his Yiddish. Stage two. When I was a boy in the late 30s and early 40s, I was sent to a Hebrew school where all my teachers, with except of one of two, all my teachers were Polish Jews who had gone to a Tarbut school, right? Many of you know the Tarbut schools. And the Tarbut schools, some of you went to the Tarbut schools, okay? The Tarbut schools were basically part of this wonderful cultural efflorescence, which includes the, the Shalom Aleichem schools and the Bon and things of the sort. But in the Tarbut schools, everything was done in Hebrew, except for the language of the country, which you had to teach in Polish or Litvish or whatever other language it was. So my, and these people were all Zionists. I thought they were religious, but they weren't. How would I know? 
they weren't religious people, they were secular people. But they went, I was brought up by Tarbut school people. And in fact, the textbooks which I use, and I still have here with me in Los Angeles, as a boy and as a teenager, were the same textbooks which you probably used, where did you come from? Yeah, it was the same stuff. <laughs> they, were, they were published in Varsha, some in Vilna, and some in Tel Aviv, right? These were the books that we used. They were not published in New York, because in New York they weren't publishing these books yet. So basically, in many ways, I had a certain type of orientation. I had not heard of the Bund. The Bund was not described at home, was not discussed at home. The fam, part of the family which was left wing were all communists, all members of the party, which was very typical of the period. But you have to understand that my background, my training, yes, I'm one generation from Eastern Europe in many ways, but it's a different kind of Eastern Europe. That is to say, those people who took the major option the second option, that is to say, they, they left. They came to America. And they came to America. Some were Zionists, some were Bundists. Most of them just tried to make a living. That was my father. He belonged to no organization, no synagogue, no nothing. But he was a good father. OK? Now, why do I bring this all up? For me, the antagonism between Zionism and Bundism is totally meaningless. It is not part of my life. It is not part of my background. Second, it's quite clear to me that because of certain historical accidents, Zionism was triumphant. It created a state with all its problems, and it has plenty of them. But after all, what happened, happened. Those Jews who stayed in Europe, unfortunately, we know what happened to them. And many of you have been through that same hell. But nevertheless, these are accidents of history. They didn't have to happen that way. They could have happened in another way. But that's what happened. But as far as the antagonism between the Bund and Zionism, for me, it was obvious to me when I first began to learn about the Bund, which is in the 1950s. It's not my argument. It's not the battle of my life. Though indeed, in this very room, 25 years ago, I was attacked for being a Zionist. <laughs> I don't forget. <laughs> in this very room, I was attacked for being a Zionist. As if I came to bring the... Uh, enemy point of view, and why should I come here? But when Dr. Gordon called me up, I said, well, you know, I have enough courage to do that again. <laughs> At any rate, now, let me bring up s several points. I'm not going to go and give you a recitation of the history and the successes of the Zionist movement, or the failures of the Zionist movement. I'd like to talk about three things uh, which perhaps are not familiar to some of you. The first of all thing is, yes, we are celebrating today, uh, today as part of this year, 100 years of uh, the beginning of the Bund, the beginning of Zionism. Incidentally, may I say, my wife's grandfather was in the first meeting of the Bund. In fact, uh, one of the professors in Tel Aviv, writing about the Bund, had was looking for him to get oral testimony, and finally, by the time he found him, he had already been dead five years, but he lived in Tel Aviv. He was also a Zionist. Don't ask me how he put it together in his mind. It never made much sense to his family. It made a great deal of sense to him. In 1923, he made Aliyah and settled in Tel Aviv. In fact, not only was he at the first meeting of the Bund, there was an earlier meeting in 1892 of a Jewish socialist group in Vilna, and he was one 
of the four speakers. And we have, indeed, uh, transcripts of that speech. He spoke in Yiddish, the other spoke in Russian. And he spoke in Yiddish out of principle. He knew Russian. He was not going to speak in Russian. It's a Jewish group who speak in Yiddish. So that's my credential on that side. We talked about a hundred years. But really, I think we have to go back really to the 1860s. The 1860s is an interesting period because it's at that period when uh, the Jewish groups in general become politically aware. If you notice, in 1860s is when you first begin to get weekly periodicals coming out. The dailies come out in the 1880s. But it's the 1860s when you begin to get Yiddish periodicals and Hebrew periodicals coming out in the 1860s. This is in response to the demands and the needs of a growing mass of people who felt that the status quo in Eastern Europe was unbearable. Remember the 1860s, at least at the beginning of the 1860s, was a period of relative liberalization in Russia. But this liberalization by the late part of the decade had retreated, reaction set in, and the Jews understood it very well. They had a very keen political sense. So the truth of the matter is that many of the things that come to fruition by the institutionalizing and the organizing of the Zionist Congress, or the first meeting of the Bund in Varsha, in Vilna, in Vilna, uh, these things really start percolating several decades earlier in the 1860s, and you really can't understand very much of what's going on in the 90s until you see that a basis had been created over well over a generation of people reading this material, some in Yiddish and some in Hebrew, a little bit in Russian also. But this is what was going on and going on very, very vibrantly and dynamically. It's a long historical process. These things don't happen overnight. The second point I would like to make is to focus, to jump ahead and focus on something bizarre, almost unknown to most people, and shows you somewhat the accidents of history that happened in the late 1920s. In the late 1920s, for reasons which are not entirely clear to us, the entire Hebrew literary establishment of Eastern Europe, which was the center, uh, Odessa, uh, Varsha, Vilna, lots of other smaller places, but these were the major points. All right, Odessa, you understand, after all, when the communists come in, Odessa is part of the Soviet Union, and you can't do very much there. But a lot of the people from Odessa moved, had moved out, and some of them went to Berlin, etc., etc. Some of them went to Warsaw, some of them went to Vilna, some of them went to Tel Aviv. But all of a sudden you notice that between 1925 and 1930-31, the entire literary establishment of Hebrew had left Europe. Very few writers of any significance were left in Europe. And I'm talking about not only writers, I'm talking about editors, publishers, book dealers, the entire literary establishment. And there's no record of any sort of meeting of people who said, OK, now we have to go. There's no record of that. In some mysterious way, they all decided to leave. Now, you see this easily recorded by two things. If you look at publication lists, and we have them, of where books were published and when, you will see that in the 1930s already, relatively few Hebrew books of any significance were published in Eastern Europe. This is before anybody even knew who Hitler was. Remember, 25 to 30, they weren't aware of Hitler. 
but they left. Now what's the result of the second result of this? The second result is part sad, part mysterious, but something worth thinking about. We, the Jewish people, have lost in the Second World War not only the usual numbers that we have, six million individuals, but we lost the whole culture and the cultural productivity and cultural establishment. The bizarre thing is, and very few people are aware of this, that very few Hebrew writers were killed by the Nazis. Very, very few. When I asked my Israeli colleagues, when I mentioned that to them, and they never thought of this, I said, give me a name. Well, I can give you three names of significant writers. I mean, there are a lot of less significant writers. After all, lots of people were writing. But very few Hebrew writers of any significance were killed in the Holocaust. Pure accident of history. It had nothing at all to do, you can say, for instance, what if you say, well, they had a prophetic understanding in 1928 that things were going to happen, there's going to be a Hitler. They had no prophetic understanding. They didn't even understand what was going on. In fact, you know very well, most Jews until 1939, 40, 41, and in Hungary until 44, really didn't know what was going on. They didn't know. We know by the records that they didn't know. Nobody assumed, nobody expected. We know things were bad, but nobody thought of death camps. That's why it was very hard to accept the news when it came out, because nobody could think of it. So as a result of this very bizarre type of situation, the Hebrew literary establishment, the whole Hebrew cultural enterprise, continued with added energy. They had sustained next to no losses in the Second World War. Whereas the, most of the Yiddish literary establishment, the great writers, some of whom have been mentioned already, thinkers, essayists, Many of them did not survive the war. This is also an accident of history. And the last point that I would like to make is here we stand in 1997. Uh, if we look at the political situation in Israel today, it is very depressing. From the whole point, a lot of points of view. Unless you have to be, happen to be a, a great supporter of, say, Netanyahu and whatever he represents today, because he changes his mind every day, or you happen to be right-wing religious, I don't see many people of that sort in this room, unless you happen to be of those groups, you know that the situation is very de depressing. And in a certain sense, it is difficult to enter a mood of celebration of the 50th anniversary of Israel when you know the situation in Israel is so depressing from a political point of view and a religious point of view. Let me remark and finish on that point. You know, one of the things that the Jews learned to do, and which is the product, and from which both Bundism and Zionism was, is to be politically active. To take your fate into your own hands, to do things, to vote, to form political coalitions and things of the sort. Uh, Marvin just mentioned a whole variety of things of that sort. This is one of the great triumphs of Jews learned that they can and should take their own fate in their own hands. And that begins in the 1860s. That notion is an 1860s notion. 60s and 70s, they learn that lesson. But that lesson also means that you had clashes in the past between Zionists and Bundists, 
clashes, which are totally meaningless today, since we don't have the same situation. It also means that you're going to lead to the creation of a state in which you have these clashes between the religious and the not religious, between the right and the left, between those who are looking for some solution with the Arabs and those who want no solution with the Arabs. So I would like to leave you with one thought, and that is that part of the great triumph of Jewish activism, which is both Bund and Zionism, leads to this very vibrant, though depressing, political state which we have in Israel today. The Jews wanted to return to history, as we always say. Okay, the Jews have returned to history, and now they're acting like everybody else who acts in history. Thank you very much. Professor Bent, as I will verstate Yiddish, many as your Zelta candidat for the Bund. In a Oysfirm, in fact. Excuse me. I also think that the professor is also a candidate for socialist science. Jeden Fals. Wir danken Professor Ben für uns teilzunehmen in unserem Nachmittag in dem Heidegger. Ich finde es auch noch geklärt, dass er am Merkwürdiger Nachmittag. Wir haben sich nicht gekannt vorstellen, in die pharmakomedische Zeiten, wo die Vitalität von dem miserigen europäischen Jeden ist gegen ein anderer wie von dem Amerikaner geht. Wir haben gewollt, einer dem anderen überzeugen in unsere Ideen. Und hat viele gehabt physische Kampf. Wir gucken jetzt zurück mit den Augen von Menschen, welche seinen 60, 70 Jahre alt und noch älter oder noch jünger. Wir seien geboren weicher und verständiger. Und der Hurben hat uns alle Menschen vereinigt. Die einzige Sache wissen wir, als wie lange das jüdische Volk wird existieren, weil wir kämpfen für unser Dasein und für unser Sein in der Meluche. Der Golus wird nicht liquidiert werden, was ist physisch unmöglich. Ich soll mir alle verhitten die Melucheschaft, kämpfen für ihre gerechte Ziel und kämpfen für Deutlichkeit, für unsere Existenz da auf dem Ort. Alle wei wollt gewesen in dem Knesset, in Jerusalem als eine tiefe Verständigung wie zwischen dem Kulturclub, dem Arbeiterring, der Schollenbewegung und der progressive zionistische Sozialistische. Zum 100-jährigen Gebäudentag von den zwei kolossalen politischen Ideen wünschen mir sie beiden. Und ich als alte, alte Bundeske wünsche, als mir so umgehen mit dem äußergewöhnlichen Holen von einer besseren, schöneren und friedlichen Welt. Scheinen unsere heutigen Nachmittag haben wir verbeten dem Chor von Arbeiterink unter der Leitung von der sehr genieter und beliebter Malke Schau, welcher zugegreht ein gleichen Programm 
ein Programm ein Jüdischen und ein Programm ein Hebräischen. Ihr seht, die Chinesen haben das in ihrer Schule nicht getan. Wir haben das getan. Da grüßen wir den Korb und Arbeiterin und die unfairen Malke Show. Es ist auch uns verscheinend und sind noch nicht.
Dumitru. Gerbion Duncan Professor Arnold Ben, Professor Martin Zuckerman, Dr. Michael Levy, Um Lomirzif Nemen Suder Arbet, Lomir Alex Susanen Spinnen, Dem Goldenen Fodem, Welche Heist the Yiddish Leben, Yiddish Existence, Wo es soll nicht sein. Seid alle gesund und vergriffen. Und jetzt wollen wir Herr Heilbein sehr mit Kuchen, Tage und Schiff.